Okay, and we're here with City Council candidate Armin Malconians. Armin, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, do you want to just tell us about yourself and your background and why you're running for City Council? Sure. Uh, I'm Armin Malconians. I'm a, by trade. I'm a civil and en environmental engineer. I'm self-employed. Graduated in 1993 from UCLA. And pretty much after that, I've been around the west side. Uh, Santa Monica resident for 12 years now. Uh, in a rent control department, uh, one of the smaller bungalow apartments that are still left. Um, I am the founder of Residocracy. Um, we've done some good civic work in the past and I've run for city council before and I'm running again uh, this year to uh, effectuate some change. Thanks. So I wanted to start by asking about Residocracy and your involvement with that. So there's the, the Facebook page, which you administer, seems to be like a hotbed for posts that contain racism, xenophobia, and sometimes conservative Republican talking points. So do you take any ownership of what's posted there? How does that, what gets posted there, those posts that cross the line, how does that reflect on Residocracy as a brand, which is, of course, so associated with you personally, uh, to have that kind of hateful rhetoric on your group? Uh, well, I kind of a little bit take offense to what you're saying because they, like, you know, you'd have to give me an example of what's um, been posted on there. I think that was a very broad and overreaching, wide sweeping um, kind of a, 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 a portrait from our uh, opponents from the past um, that has happened that way. Um, we, I do allow all voices in the community to kind of open up within residocracy, whether they be conservative or Democrat, progressives or Republicans. Um, I'm, I'm more of a free speech kind of a guy so that, that I don't bump somebody off that has a different political persuasion as I do. Um, but I'd like to hear some examples of this kind of stuff that you're saying. So. I've seen language describing uh, homeless people uh, and even just renters as in uh, unflattering terms, which is, I think, putting it nicely. Well, you, you kind of said racism and xenophobia, and now you're talking about anti. So I don't, I don't um, understand. Give me a specific example of where there was a racist post that wasn't removed. Um, it's happened in the past, but I have removed um, mm -hmm. those posts. Um, as well, let me ask you in a different way pertaining to city council. So if you were on city council and you were uh, witnessing uh, those kinds of remarks, either from a colleague or from some um, uh, a member of the public, uh, how would you respond to it? Um, in the council chambers or outside the council chambers? Or sure, yeah. Let's... Or in your role as a city council member? I, I would definitely put a stop to it immediately. Um, I know that the, uh, for example, I don't know if you've ever been to a city of Los Angeles um, city council hearing. It's, it's done a lot differently than what Santa Monica does. Um, speakers in Los Angeles will get up and they'll, they'll curse the council. They'll say all kinds of things. And city of Los Angeles, for example, allows that speech from a public, um, as a public input. They don't limit it. That's their policy. Um, that's, a, that's a free speech type of a response. Um, I, Santa Monica does not do that, of course, <laughs> or we also don't have those kinds of speakers generally in our council chambers. Um, as much as City of Los Angeles, if you, if you listen to the difference, there's a huge difference in, in how people behave. Um, I would definitely stop it um, if I see any kind of, you know, I'm not a racist, I'm an anti-racist. Um, I don't understand why these questions are even coming at me because somebody on social media may have posted something that I would have removed. So I take offense to the question. It's a smear question to try to um, attack me. Um, and so it, without providing any specific example of what you're referring to, I, I can't really respond. I understand. OK, thanks, Armin. Let's go to Danny. Hi, Armin. Um, so when Council Member Negrete pulled her rent control proposal, um, she said, and I quote, I hope the council will put forward the path that gives all renters uniform relief and stability, such as the rent control board's proposal. So based on your questionnaire, why do you believe that council members, council member Negrete, Negrete's proposal 
um, was innovative in your words, and why do you think the rent control board's proposal is regressive? Well, I think that um, what what we failed to do is address Council Member DeGray's original proposal was trying to address the inequalities of the, the um, of, of the economics of all the renters. So the lower half would get a zero percent increase. I honestly don't understand how the renters' rights movement came up and said that. Um, half of the renters getting a 0% increase is anti-rent control. It's completely the opposite. When you give a 0% rent increase to the bottom half of the renters, it's full rent control. It, it's full uh, in favor of rent control. The city of Los Angeles has had for the last two years a 0% increase in all rent controlled units. 0% rent increase allowed for all rent controlled units. The city of Santa Monica, who's supposed to be a champion for rent control, has failed to provide any of those uh, relief measures to the tenants. That's why Negretti's proposal was innovative. It allowed the bottom 50% to have a 0% rent increase. And the rest of the tenants, by the way, would, would get the increase as was proposed by the SMER uh, <laughs> um, uh, ballot measure, which was approved, I think, in 2012 which has been a great ballot measure. I'm a rent control tenant. My rent increases have been very minor, very minimal over the last 12 years. I get like a you know, $20 a rent uh, increase every year. It's very affordable. It's a very great protection. And to allow the bottom 50% to have a 0% increase during these inflationary times was pro-rent control, it was not anti-rent control. And it's regressive because when you put a cap on the higher numbers, so somebody, for example, paying $12,000 a month in a rent controlled unit would only get a $70 increase under the new rent control. Whereas a lower rent pay, which is a very small percentage, that's a regressive uh, uh, increase. It, it basically what it does is that the higher income tenants get the least amount of increases. And in the Santa Monica that I wanna live in, that I wanna represent, I want the lower uh, the people who can afford less to have the lower increases in terms of the percentage of their payments. My neighbors will be affected. Some of my neighbors will be affected by a 3% increase. That's the reality. Thanks. So, next, go to Patricia now. Yeah. Okay, so, so Armin, you know that Lana's, Lana's proposal did not seek out the renters who could least afford the 6%. It sought out the renters who had the lowest rent and having the lowest rent does not mean that you're the person who can least afford rent. There's no correlation whatsoever. Um, and, and, and for example, you talk about providing those in the lower socioeconomic groups with housing cost certainty. And then you say you're in a rent controlled unit and I don't believe that you're in the lowest socio lower socioeconomic class. You know, you're 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 an engineer. You're you're working. So 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 you're saying that the that 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 you're in a lower socioeconomic class because you live in a rent controlled unit, and that's just not not accurate. So let me go back to the issue that I wanted to bring up, and that's that that you're your response to a question on this questionnaire, that a member of our club put a question on the questionnaire that you don't like, and you turn into a scold and you say, shame on you, Democratic Club. How could you even ask the question? You were talking about free speech a minute ago, but you don't think that a member of our club should be allowed to ask a certain kind of question because I guess the subject is taboo. You know, we have all, I bet you every single person in this room has had an interaction with police and police departments that has been positive. It's not an anti-police question to ask about the police officers association. Now, now the fact that you didn't think that the question should be asked at all and shame on us for even thinking of a question that you don't like, uh, you know, brings to mind the, po the, the Washington Post slogan, which is democracy dies in the dark. I don't think that there are subjects that are taboo. And when, like you were talking about the city council in Los Angeles, and we do see things like that at our city council meeting, we see blatantly racist, blatantly 
anti-Semitic, blatantly homophobic statements made during public comments with some regularity. And that's called a public forum. And at that public forum, you know, they could accuse the city manager of, of you know, criminal activity. But if they go outside onto the steps of City Hall and then have a press conference and repeat that accusation, then it becomes slanderous. So, you know, I, I, I can't tell whether you're in favor of free speech or whether you, in fact, you want to be the censor of free speech by, by saying that it's shameless for us even to ask a question that was brought up by a member of the club. So that was my speech for the night. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, the, well, the, the, uh, if you remind me, the first part you um, you spoke about my other question, um, the answer to my other question, um, and and I and, and I'm sorry because it, 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 you switched topics, so I forgot about the first okay. part. I'd like to respond. To. It, it was it was on on Lana's proposal, which helped the people who were below median rent, not below median income, not yeah. people who couldn't afford it, but the people uh, who, um, okay. Yeah, I, 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 thank you for rent, which has yeah. nothing to do with people's income. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, you're right. I am a civil environmental engineer. I am self-employed and I'm not in the bottom uh, socioeconomic uh, level. However, my rent is in the bottom 50% because I've been there for 12 years. But I can also tell you that I am the only person in our two building complex that fits that mold. The rest of the people who live in there are elderly. They've been in there for a very long time. They don't fit that mold. They're, they're on uh, fixed incomes, okay? So I am one, and, and our building, by the way, is now the second time up for sale. It will probably be Ellis. Uh, it's the second time that all of the tenants, all of the elderly tenants are going through this. Yes, I can afford to move into a different unit in Santa Monica, but the rest of my the rest of my neighbors, none of them, zero of them can do that. So I'm going based on the average of, of I'm an engineer, I'm good with numbers. The people who have been in Santa Monica for the longest and the lowest of 50% are generally gonna be the ones that are gonna be elderly, that are gonna be on more fixed incomes. And it, it is definitely a regressive tax when somebody paying $10,000 a month for rent, which they do exist, a lot of them do exist in market rate that are rent controlled units, will get a $70 cap on the rent. I, and the I'm, lower I'm not arguing that part of it. No, that I, was I, right, that's my response to that. So in general, the numbers, 100%, there was no study done. The, however, we knew that inflation was coming. We knew that the rent control board had, had, had full purview. They could have gone through this and it, in a timely fashion. They failed to act. We know that the council could have gone through this. They failed to act. The count, uh, however, Lana's proposal was innovative. It would have it would have been a temporary measure, which would have given a zero percent rent increase, and it would have followed the rest of what was approved by the voters, and, and a ballot measure that was placed on by the renters' rights advocates and the renters' rights group in 2012, I believe, was when I when I, when I first moved in, and I read that, and I thought, wow, okay. Um, but, you know, to make it seem villainous that, that the change slate is now anti-rent control, which came out yesterday in the, in the Santa Monica for Renters' Rights letter that was, that was <laughs> to this membership, is absolutely ludicrous, okay? Now, to answer the question about the free speech, yes, shame on the Democratic Club for asking that question. You are asking people to pledge that they will not accept a donation from a, the police who are our friends. It's not anti-speech. It's my speech to say, shame on the Democratic Club. As free speech works both ways. The Democratic Club can ask a question and I can give an answer. I, my answer is how I feel and how I believe that the community of Santa Monica feels. That's what I'm doing. I'm running for city council to represent the community. If they agree with me, they will vote for me. If they don't, they won't. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Armin. Let's go to Dan. Thanks, John. So Armin, in your questionnaire, uh, I'm a little disturbed by some of the incorrect information you have in your answers, particularly around uh, homelessness. For instance, you state that most unhoused individuals in Los Angeles County are transient with, quote, predominantly out-of-state origins. So 
That is false. According to the data out of our recent countywide homeless counts, 80% of unsheltered Angelinos have lived here for more than five years. Two thirds of those unsheltered Angelinos become homeless in Los Angeles County. Homelessness is a problem of local system failures. So what systems do you see failing here in Santa Monica that are contributing to homelessness in our own community? From our own residents or from, um, I, I, the number of Santa Monica residents that are homeless on our street has gotta be very small. I don't know if we've ever done that study. We should do that study. I don't think we've ever done that study. I haven't seen the information on that. Um, most of the homeless in Santa Monica are definitely not Santa Monica residents. That's not to say that Santa Monica residents cannot fall homeless. So um, I don't, I, the, the answer would have been from Santa Monica. I'm not so sure about uh, LA County. So I'd have to look at my answer. Okay, thanks. And we'll go to Janine. Uh, yeah. Hi, Armin. Um, okay, um, I'm going to ask a question about the um, about the city staffers um, for the top city staffers and um, are their salaries too high? And um, I saw consistent answers. You know, it's, it's a um, has been a tighter labor market, and um, and so we should um, not react. Um, you know, uh, to, to uh, retain our employees. But I needed um, some clarification on your comment on, we must also have accountability standards. Are you, if you got elected, would you propose to city staff for a new performance management system? Are you proposing that there are no um, accountability standards at this point? So I just wanted a little bit of clarification on your answer. So I go back to, I, I did work for the uh, government at the very beginning of my career. So I worked for both um, California Department of Transportation as well as the US Army uh, Corps of Engineers. So a state agency and a federal agency. Um, I actually, in, in, my, in my working with the state, I was on a survey crew. We were the hardest working survey crew in the greater Los Angeles area. I was out in the San Bernardino area at the time. Um, and we probably worked about three and a half hours a day, literally. Um, there was no there was no standard set, but we were the hardest working crew, and we are known as the hardest working crew. And we worked about three and a half hours a day. When I was at the uh, at the federal government, um, we um, worked um, a lot more efficiently. Um, I was a student intern at the time, and um, what happened is the federal government did like a little bit of an audit. So they came in and they wanted to get things um, managed. And so they sat down with every single employee and they did an interview. They figured out what you're working on, what you're doing, how you can do things better. And they interviewed you and they said, look, we're not going to, we're going to come up with, we're going to change your job classification if we need to. We're going to combine job classification. We're going to set standards that what we need to meet. And it was engineering. So for example, we had drafters who would draft by hand who um, became then computer tech technician drafters, right? But they were classified as engineers. And so they weren't really engineers. So that we ended up doing a reclassification and ended up having levels that people needed to meet. The whole system became much more productive. The money didn't change, but the system became much more productive. People were held to different standards. They, they, they set bars. You've got to do this in order to keep your job status and your job classification. We're going to move you up to this level of what you need to do. I think that that's a great thing to do in an organization. I think now that we've gone through the um, COVID um, kind of, you know, the layoffs, I call them, right? The, 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 the kind of downsizing, and, and now we're going to start coming up. I think it's a great time to get in and do that across the board is to have some kind of like an audit where you're sitting down, you're going through, it's a, it's a consultant basis kind of, it, it generates a report. Um, and, we, and we increase our productivity. I think also as an employee, you feel a lot better. Um, you know, there was people at, at the core that had nothing to do and, they, and it, it wasn't productive. It wasn't productive for them. After this exercise that, that occurred, they had more job responsibilities. They did more things. They were happier. They, got, they actually it led to higher pay, but we had much more productivity. And so that's what I'm kind of referring to. I see. So you you would, uh, uh, one of the things you would do uh, because uh, you think um, a government, a city government needs to be audited. It would be to propose an extensive uh, compensation and staffing and productivity study. 
Um, and, 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 I mean, it's, it's not like, it's, I'm not suggesting, you know, a Gestapo type thing at all. I'm talking about increasing productivity for both um, uh, employee retention, as well as for the services that we provide and for, for, for the benefit to the residents as well. So it's gotta be a win-win-win scenario. I, I'm not looking at this as a, as a cutting measure, as a, you know, any, anything that, um, it, but to increase productivity, I think when we increase productivity, it, in effect, we're lowering our cost. And so, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of that. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Let's go to Isabel. Uh, yeah. Hi, Aaron. Um, Hi, so on your questionnaire, you actually listed crime and public safety as the top three issues. So you listed that same issue three times. Um, why uh, do you think uh, this is the the top issue in Santa Monica uh, over everything else. And uh, what do you propose to do about it? Because it is. <laughs> because um, I, again, in, in, in the last four or five years, my mother-in-law has been attacked. My car has been um, right outside my apartment, you know, and I live in a decent neighborhood in Santa Monica. My car uh, has been keyed once. It's been, the window's been bashed in on different, different cars. The window's been bashed in. One car has been completely stolen. I've had my uh, catalytic converter stolen off another car. Um, and all the car stuff happened in the last two years or so, mm -hmm. um, except for the key. It happened um, probably about four years ago. Um, I walk into the alley and it, and, and it becomes sketchy at night to throw away trash. I've got to, you know, I stopped doing that for quite a while. Um, I just stopped doing it, taking the trash out. Um, it's on everybody's mind. It's number one, it's number two, it's number three. If you talk to anybody in Santa Monica, that's what they'll tell you. They don't feel safe. You know, I've been, I've been going to a lot of community meetings over the years. And at first we were told, you know, when you're walking, be aware, don't be on your cell phone, be aware of your surroundings, you know? And I, I just, that was four or five years ago. Now it's like you're going to get your cell phone taken away from you if you have it in your hand potentially. It's happening. So it's it's number one, it's number two, it's number three. Santa Monica has had the same police. And what, what am I going to do about it? Santa Monica's had the same police force for the last, I don't know how long, 20 years. You know, we haven't had any staffing increases. Um, however, we've gotten the metro. Santa Monica's grown. Santa Monica is, has a different demand now than it did when we first set our, our targets. We need to expand our police force. That's the bottom line. We need more patrol. We need visible patrol. We need, um, I work in Beverly Hills. That's where my office is. And when I come outside for a 15 minute lunch, I see more police on the street in that 15 minutes than I do in the entire week in Santa Monica. We're just understaffed. So that's what we need. We need additional budget. We don't need less budget. We don't need to take any money away from the police. We don't need to defund the police. We need to fund the police. We need safety in Santa Monica. It's on everybody's mind. All of the voters want public safety. Voters or non-voters want safety. They feel unsafe. That's why it's number one, it's number two, and it's number three. Okay. Thank you. And Dan? Okay. So. I want to respond to that question first before I have my own question. And and I appreciate that the yes, there have been lots of catalytic converters that have been stolen in the past couple of years. I totally acknowledge that, you know, arson of trash cans and grand theft of commercial trucks and and buses are specifically up. Um, and that you may feel that way, but the data doesn't show that at all. In 2021, part one offenses, which include homicide, rape robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, grand theft auto, and arson were down overall 2.9%, with notable decreases in rape, residential burglary, and larceny theft. Rape was down 58%, robbery was down 42%, all from five-year highs, and larceny down 36%. Total number of crimes have been constantly falling since 2018 from a high of 5,441 to 4,248 in 2021. That's a 22% decrease. So I personally think our cops are doing a pretty damn good job in this city. And I think the data shows that. I recognize that many residents feel a different way about that, but we have to look at the data when it comes to crime. Um, 
but I, I have another question. I know we're running low on time. Um, so in your questionnaire, you mentioned developing hotels along the beach as something you support. Can you share specifically where you would support further development of our beachfront? Well, I think we'd have to do some studies um, and we'd have to get some proposals out. So I can't tell you exactly where right now, but we do need to um, revitalize our downtown. We need to get the economic engine going. Um, we can't be talking about cuts, 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 and then no revenue growth. We need to revitalize Santa Monica. It has been destroyed since the, uh, what I'll call the riots um, in downtown Santa Monica. It has not come back. If you walk down there, it's a ghost town. I walked the, the promenade the other night. It was about 10.30 at night on a Monday night. It was abysmal. Nobody's on the street anymore. It's about 50% vacancy in terms of square footage. And we need to revitalize our downtown. I would support a hotel on the promenade, a boutique hotel. I would also look at the um, at, at, at Ocean Avenue to see what 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 can what can work there. Um, hotels, I think, don't bring as much traffic. They bring good um, revenue to the city, and they will revitalize our tourism business, which we need. So you talk you talk that crime is down. However people in different countries realize that the crime in Santa Monica is up. It's a visual. They don't come to Santa Monica anymore. Being in Beverly Hills, I see the tourism business is starting to rebound much more than in Santa Monica. I talk to tourists who come to Beverly Hills. They say we were going to stay in Santa Monica, but because of the situation of the crime that we've heard about, we won't stay there. We don't stay there. I've heard of stories where people will check into a hotel in Santa Monica wanting to stay a week and they leave the next day and go to a different city. We can't afford that as a city. We can't have any of the social services that you want when, without the, ec the economic engine. So, um, and, and to a, a rebuttal really quick to your crime stats, you just keep telling the residents of Santa Monica that when they're barricading themselves inside, when they're afraid to go outside, you keep telling them crime is down. They believe their eyes, they believe their neighbors. You talk about catalytic converters, why the stats are down. My name, my eight-year-old neighbor just had her catalytic converter stolen about two weeks ago. She didn't want to report it. She said, I don't, I don't think anything's gonna happen. The only reason she reported it was because her insurance company said that if you report it, we can you can file a claim. If you don't, you can't file a claim. So there's a lot of stuff that's being unreported because that's what happens when when a city goes down. You know, we need to turn that around. That's why crime, public safety, number one, number two, and number three. Thanks, Armin. I want to ask you one more question. Um, in your questionnaire, you mentioned uh, the potential need to challenge the arena allocation in court. And I was wondering if you are at all concerned about whether that could leave us exposed to HCD coming and taking over and are us losing local control as a result. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is a real concern. Um, however, I think we can uh, mitigate that. I, I think we can, we can be in discussions with them as well. You know, Santa Monica has done a lot in the past. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a civil engineer, you know. I wrote the infrastructure element for the city of Los Angeles when we got the, the, the Metro lines first in Los Angeles, analyzing all of the infrastructure and the demand and the deficiencies uh, in the system. Um, it was called LA Framework. Um, and uh, Growth was supposed to be based on um, the ability to sustain it through your infrastructure. Infrastructure being all, all, all of it, sewer, water, trash, um, police, fire, hospitals, schools, you name it, you know, it's part of the infrastructure. You know, it's our build back better plan. It's everything that's involved with structure, with infrastructure. Um, we haven't done that in, in Santa Monica. The other, uh, about two months ago, a month and a half ago, six weeks ago, I had my electricity go out the entire Wilmot in their neighborhood almost had their electricity go out almost for six hours on a rolling ground up. We can't handle, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the arena numbers. Um, not to mention, by the way, it's going to be a huge impact on rent control. As soon as you get all of these units in, your, your numbers of rent control units in relation to the overall units are going to go down. And guess who's going to vote out rent control? It's all of these new units. That's, that's the death of rent control. Lana's not the death of rent control. The change state's not the death of rent control. The voters are the, are, the, are the death of rent control. And the only ways the voters will, will get rid of rent control is if we increase the number of units at an exponential rate. 
then they will vote it out. That's my opinion. And I and I'm a renter, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm faced with a potential Ellis eviction anytime soon, you know, um, it's, it, it, I'm not speaking out of some, you know, you tried to at the beginning characterize me as a, as a right wing. I'm not at all. I'm telling you, I'm sitting here screaming that what's being done in our city is going to kill rent control. It's going to kill low, the low income tenant. It's going to lead to a less diverse city. And it's a mistake. It's, it's, a, it's a policy push that's being pushed down our, our throats. And it's a mistake. The, uh, the park project uh, that replaced four fifths in Arizona does not lower rent prices. It increases rent prices astronomically. Two bedroom apartments are going for $26,000 a month. Studios are starting at $4,000 a month. It's a mistake. It does not lower prices. It's not, it's not a matter of, of what we hear from the urbanization group of, uh, of, a, uh, of, 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 of the supply and demand. It's not, there's an infinite demand. The bigger we build, the more, another question on my thing was about the pricing. Right. So if we don't have local control, if we don't keep our zoning to lower levels, if you increase densification, it increases prices of, of property, it increases the, the, the height, the construction cost. You have to have the higher rents in order to get the, any project built and done. If there's enough money in the world that wants to come to Santa Monica, because we at the end of the at the end of the day, we live in a wonderful place. We all know it. No matter what side of the political spectrum we, we are on, so, you know how far left we are, we all know Santa Monica is a wonderful city. I am trying to protect it just as much as you guys are, except I am saying that I think you're wrong. <laughs> That's you know we just disagree on the methodology. So I don't appreciate it when I do get pointed. You know when when people say because there's somebody who's who's on on the right who's posting something that that means that I am a Trumper. I am not. I'm a Democrat. I'm, I consider myself a progressive Democrat, although the progressive party has moved way too much beyond me, <laughs> okay? But I'm a Democrat. Um, and I am somebody who's interested in protecting the residents of Santa Monica, all of the residents of Santa Monica, the renters and the homeowners and the business owners, everybody who's in Santa Monica. It's a wonderful place. I would like to keep it that way. That's why I'm running for Santa Monica City Council. Great. Well, thanks so much, Armin. I appreciate you, uh, you know, responding to our tough questions, but uh, we really appreciate you coming through. Sure. And thank you for having me in your interviews and um, good luck with the process. And uh, at the end, we'll all be Santa Monica residents in, in a wonderful city. That's right. Thanks a lot. Thanks again. I get, you get your endorsement. Thank you.